I am dedicating uh, this event to her. And we were having now a, an artist that many of you admire, you know, Gary, he got to be doing a performance for us. And later on, we got to go to start with Ed Kern, and from there, we got to go around. Welcome, happy to have you here.
say so. I know I have a lot left. Do what you can. I will. So you're looking at paying uh, can you see this one over here? So these paintings are within the last six or eight months. Um, there are 15 or 20 of them in this group. Uh, they're pretty well distributed now uh, in, this, in, this, in New York, I should say. I would say the city. There's some of the business city for others. There are other cities. And uh, some are in Philly, and a couple have gone to Japan. So I don't know how that happened. It's been pretty dry lately <laughs> in terms of sales and shows, but it has. I'm interested, if you can hear me at all, lately in perception, um, the physicality of painting. And I've been reading in neuroscience for about 10 or 12 years. I've worked with neuroscientists in, in teaching and in collaborative work, also with dancers and, um, and other scientists, and many engineers as well. And the physicality of this work, you know, pushing, building textures, came from uh, having such a lucky, fortuitous beginning. Uh, there's a painter named de Kooning who used to say that I was elegant before I was competent. He meant it well, but it, and, and at the time I didn't even get the irony of what he was saying. But this was a group of abstract expressions in the city that I was lucky enough to be a part of, and the one thing I got from them was this business of being alone, which they felt they were, after the war. And how the hell can you make a painting in the face of the most recent tragedy? What, what can you do? And it became, as Harold Rosenberg called it, action painting. So they made big, bombastic, Russian paintings. And at the time I got to New York, they were phasing out a little bit because the pop artists, in terms of the big time, were taking over the markets. So they were sort of bitter, and I had a, I felt like a grandchild. I didn't like the pop artists myself. I loved these hard drinking crazy people that started essentially what became contemporary art in this country. Many of them are expatriates who came to the States escaping Hitler's horrors. Not the least of which was a man named Marshall. There was a guy named Arshel Gorky who came to this country. I met him through the corner, and he was an Armenian. He had his own set of tragedies. And one of the things he said to me during that time was, when I came here, I asked Bill, meaning the Kuni, what my, should my name be? Because he came with the name Vostag Adonia. <laughs> so Phil said, think of something American. And he comes up with Arshel Gorky. <laughs> so so they, were, they had their own moments. But the, the idea of camaraderie, the idea of exchange, and the very physical nature of the painting. I could see, and I witnessed uh, people like Bill painting, and they would paint or he could paint for four hours. I can barely paint for an hour before I'd have to go smoke a cigarette or take a nap. I didn't have that kind of concentration. But I did learn the language of physicality. And all of you, all of you, uh, are instruments. And we do so much to deny that. Everything that happens for us, our memories, this is from your side, and everything. There's no such thing as a camcorder recording. I'm trying to. I'm, I'm working against I don't think I can do that. Well, it's not working for you. Come on up front. Come on up front. We'll make space for you. Not going to do that. Okay. Space over here. All right. Anyway. 
So my point is, when I ran into neuroscience, I understood how much the mind-body part of painting, how important that was, how we perceive as a whole body experience. And um, I ran into a guy named Eric Kandel, who was a neuroscientist. He had a big lab in New York. And a young man named Jonah Lear. Has anybody ever heard of Jonah? He wrote a book called Proust Was a Neuroscientist. Yeah. And um, here's, the, here's the message from him in, in one of Proust's beautiful writings. He muses on smelling a butter cookie as he walks through the streets. Mm. And it's not just the smell. When he smells it, it transports him back to his mother's kitchen. You, you know what I'm talking about. So this beautiful instrument that we have is in some discordant relationship with technology. And so I am a physical painter. I move it, shake it, bake it, pull it, cook it, kick it, because I think the whole body should be involved with it. Now this is antithetical to a kind of cool uh, conceptualism. I'm not opposed to it. It's wonderful. I don't have time to do it. I'm glad colleagues have time to do it because we need that too. I'm just saying for me it's physical and it's, uh, it's important to remind ourselves of our instruments, the things we are. I love to watch Gary play because you can see his whole body making that sound for you. You know, it's, it's a physical moment. But the beginning was abstract expressionism. And then eventually, after about 15 or 20 years in New York, I came out here. And uh, the, although the city was my anchor, I met all these wonderful artists out here. And many of them are engaged with that kind of physicality. But what I, what I tell kids that I teach what, or work with is don't lose that body thing. Athletes often understand it. You do it so much and so hard that you don't have to think about it anymore. And if you look at uh, Japanese calligraphers who work with those large brushes, they start very physically and they move it that way. These are the things that are important. Uh, and these are the things that mark us from the first, we're around a campfire now, talking about an idea, but we've always been around a campfire. We've always been talking this way and culturally communicating things to others by that physicality and that action. So I have a good friend here named Luke Wen, who's a photographer. If you look at his, photo his photographs closely, the textual aspect of so many of them involve this same question. Then there's one other thing, if I may. Yeah, I would like to, then to ask you some questions. You know, oh, okay. well, we'll we'll the, yeah. the other thing I think yeah. about a lot in these paintings is the process and, and the element of time. You know, is there time? What kind of time? Geological time. If you look at this silver painting over here, and if you look at the way the paint was dropped on that, that's metallic paint with additional silver filings in it. So when I dropped it on the canvas, it built a topological layer. So it had sort of an eon uh, kind of idea of settling in. But they have to be convincing and they have to be felt. What is my responsibility to you? not entirely sure anymore. There was a time when we based it on illusion, and I could tell you, but I can tell you now, we need our senses. We need to be who we are. We're going to dra gradually change. We're going to get into, um, if you want to speak French, I'll just put a little thing there, and you'll be able to speak French. We'll solve your health problems with little bio-machines, you know, and so on. So we have to hold on to this perceptual idea for a while. I like the idea of being able to be part of a Hubble or something. I would love to be able to do that. I'll stop. I'm just, I'm just No, I would elaborate. like to, if any of the students have some questions, I would love them to ask you some questions, or anybody who wants to ask me a question. That way, if you don't mind. Okay. Any questions? Yeah. Yeah. No? Yeah, me. Otherwise, we got a lot of questions to ask you, so. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> I'm looking forward to asking yeah. questions. But. Yeah, hey, you know, if you want to ask me, yeah. yeah. I notice a lot of squiggles in yeah. there. Yeah? Tell me a little bit about about the squiggles? Yeah. What are you identifying? This is the squiggle? Yeah. Okay, so it's a technical term, so I want to know. Oh, and I notice it's your feet over there. Right. That's a way of making a form out of you know, doing this. And I'm thinking of it as a, as a form coming into being. It's not shaded. It's not, you know, gradated or, or, or shaped in that way. 
It's transparent, yet it's a form. It's sort of a biological image, an image of a, of a thing in transition. A lot of people see intestines. But that's not the idea at all. You know, the idea is not that. It's not subject driven. It's driven by qualities. Here's a quality, hard, soft. How the hell do you, what's, make me a painting of soft, will you please? Or hard, you know, that's quality. It's not an iconic image. It's an image of process, and that's the difference. So squiggle is fine, but I don't, I didn't think of, well, I'm gonna make intestines. Or, like that, and think of it that way. Is it spontaneous? Yeah. Then? Pretty much. Yep. I have a question. Yeah, you have a question? Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Um, how does that relate to neuroscience? This? Yes. Uh, it, it relates to, for example, how memory occurs. Every time you have a memory, it's a new memory. You don't, you don't locate an old memory in a file cabinet and pull it up. The brain, if I'm looking at him, for example, uh, I don't know why I'm picking him here. He's in the front yeah, row. Sorry. <laughs> when I see him and it goes in, the brain farms it out to 32 different locations and then, and then constructs an image. It's not like, um, it's not photographic. So every time I look at him, that pathway is reinforced over time. Pretty soon I might recognize him walking down the street, but it comes from all these different places. Yeah. I would think so. Yeah, I would. Yeah, we need to move. Yeah. Move? Yeah. Go, do. Yeah. I could do more. I mean, it's very 
very expensive. Uh, I don't have any thing, reason against it, except that, uh, well, I don't know, the gallery decided to do this right size. It's a good size. Is your work usually black and white? Is that so, it's historically been black and white. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow. You know, so, I mean, I, I, I do think that, that if I had, had this hanging in my house, I would be more excited about going forward. Because uh, I didn't know anything about color. And what am I going to learn? Uh, so what other standards do you go with? Uh, the, uh, there's no more paper for me to print on, and I was sick of that. So, uh, uh, and now I'm going to shoot black and white and enlarge it like this. I don't know what I'm going to do. Who cares? Huh? So the black and white from now on will that be digital? Oh, God, no. no. <laughs> I'm not smart enough to learn a new thing. I can't even use a cell phone. I don't even know where it is, which is why it's not here right now. Uh, so, uh, no, no, I, I'm an old dog. Old dog. Yeah. Eight, eight, ten. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter what you do, as long as you enjoy it, do it well. Or even if you don't enjoy it, do it well. Okay. We thank you. You're welcome. We thank you. you do it well. Telling you about her incredible award. Okay. Okay. Uh, we have a combination of stoneware and raku. So I alternate between stoneware and raku. Different clays, different firing techniques. Uh, in most cases, except the very new work, I uh, use a lot of tape resist where I apply tape to the piece and either spray color over top or hand paint. And so uh, the amount of time spent adding surface de decoration to the piece is quite lengthy. Uh, I like to think of the pieces as three-dimensional canvases. Uh, because of my math background, I'm heavily drawn to very basic design elements. You have circles, you have lines. Uh, most of the pieces uh, are divided into three and the motif generally repeats around the piece three times. So I start by gritting out the piece. It's very systematic. It's all hand-drawn with ruler and compass. No computers involved here. And so I let the design evolve. Uh, uh, sometimes because geometry is a two-dimensional thing and the pots are certainly three-dimensional, you have a skewing of your basic geometric form simply because they're not on a flat surface. And sometimes that can create very interesting results. Uh, so I start with a circle around the equator. I actually measure out, divide the piece, and then just start playing with lines and circles. Um, the newer pieces are quite a departure. Uh, it's a more painterly uh, approach to applying glaze to the pot and sort of letting the glaze do what it does. So you have blending of color, you have movement of glaze, so the pattern is not exactly as precise. It's not precise at all, but underneath it all, there is still a bit of I, I can't help myself, for example, on this piece, I had to divide the piece and I very carefully made sure I put the glaze in certain spots and not others, but um, my uh, use of color with the Raku is largely, you have surface colors that you don't control, the firing controls the colors, so after spending hours and hours doing a very complex design, uh, it's sort of like uh, organized chaos where you're sort of left to the whimsy of the firing. The colors are not necessarily your choice, but you have contrast. So I have a black, I have a white, and I have color. And so the specific colors aren't so important, but the design elements are more important and the colors are what they are. Um, questions? Yes? How long does that take? Something like that. Days. Each. You have to realize that on the stemmer pieces, the light color is where the tape was. So each piece is cut and placed. Uh, and then once the tape is on and the first layer of glaze is applied, then all the tape has to come off. So it's just a very uh, time intense process. But it's one, it's, I like doing these sort of mindless activities where you can just focus uh, and that's what I do. <laughs> when you were describing the geometric pattern, yes. painting it on the sphere, 
Have you ever folded that out to try to see what it would look as a drawing? No. Mostly, mostly with the designs, they don't have a preconceived notion, but I'll start with a line, or I'll start with a circle, and I'll just sort of divide the space. People will say that, oh, this work is perhaps African or Celtic or whatever, but I have chosen to create my own language. Uh, yes, I could easily duplicate any design I see, but I don't see the point in doing that. So I just play with geometry on the surface, basically. It's great to see the geometry hidden and this is fluid. Because I, I, it's, I can't, it's a part of who I am, I cannot escape it. No, it's great though. Yes. When you're, when you're conceiving these things, you're throwing them first. Yes. So what are you thinking about when you're throwing? Are you thinking Simple about forms. Them? Civil forms, but you're not thinking about the geometry that's going to go not at all. on the surface. I, I, yet, so I'm basically, basically creating a canvas, and so once the canvas is made, then I'll think about how I'm going to design. That's a really different way to think about ceramics. Okay. That's really great. <laughs> Just a little different that's than most great. people. <laughs> Actually, a lot different. Yeah, I know. I like that. Well, and see, that's the math part, you know, it's just as precise as I am in a lot of cases. Uh, I, I, ha I have a bundle of, of opposites working within me because this piece is certainly not precise and I didn't even, I'm, I embrace the drips on this piece. I know the glaze was going to drip and I embrace them because that's part of that process. Well, I love the way it stops here and kind of the energy runs out. So uh, it, it's it's uh, as as much as I love the precision, I also I would say that's precision, just a different. Yeah. Okay, it's a fluid precision. Yes. We thank you very very much. You're welcome. Okay. that we did together in Malta. And Malta is a very interesting place um, geologically, geographically and historically. Um, it's sort of, it's an island in the, it's an island country in the um, Mediterranean and it's also a, a place where um, refugees are sort of stopping right now. Um, so there's a lot of stuff going on with transition edges. Um, an island is in a sense a continuous edge. So these were, these paintings were really thinking about um, finding visual equivalents for transitions, edges, and islands. So I think of those little things in it as my islands. Um, so, thank you. So, and then this piece um, is obviously more collaborative at this point, and it's, so it's painting and sound. And, you can talk and about yeah, it. we live uh, along the Jordan Creek, and so every day we walk along the creek one place or another. So this kind of e evolved out of it, but it also, as we were working on the piece, um, it was November, and so we, we finished the piece in November and named it Flow, This Too Shall Pass. <laughs> so I invite you all, rather than saying any more, can we just move up, and then I'm going to time one minute of silence, because I would just like, it's been loud in here, I'd like you just to listen to it for one minute. So let's everyone just move forward. <coughs> Clear your throats. Turn your cell phones off. And uh, we'll be hidden now. One minute.
Thank you, that's, that's one minute. Just a quick plug, March 20th, I will have um, a sound installation throughout this building, so I hope you can all come back for that. And Pat and I would just like to say what a wonderful opportunity to show with this great group of artists. Gary Hassey was wonderful. Thank you, Ricardo. Thank you. Very simple section downstairs. And we thank you for your conversation. Thank you very, very, very much. Very simple section downstairs, please.